Yes, recording started. So once again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the new week. So I hope you all had a great weekend. Good. So, yes, today we will study on two books, on the book of Lamentation, which is part of Jeremiah. And along with it, we will also study the book of Ezekiel. So before we could go ahead, can we start the session with a word of prayer? Okay. Yeah. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we honor you, we lift you up, Lord. Father, we surrender each one of us in your hand, including me, oh Father. We pray that you'll open our eyes, our heart to your word. We pray that you'll open our minds to understand the word that you have written, Lord, the letter that you have written. Help us understand uh, uh, the book of Lamentation and the Ezekiel, O oh Father, the message that you are delivering to Israel, O oh Lord, the same message that you are speaking to us as an individual, O oh Father. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for giving us the understanding of your word. I pray that you will impart uh, uh, the heart to understand and apply it in our life, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so even before I could start with today's session, I will just go ahead and upload the presentation. Give me a second, please, while I share the PPT. Okay. Yes, I'm just sharing it. So we all know the author of the book, Lamentation. Who's the author of this book? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yes, thank you. Yes, so Jeremiah was the author of this book and it has five poetic laments over the destruction of Israel, Jerusalem uh, in the form of suffering and we see God's goodness and Jeremiah's sorrow upon the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. It's just the continuation of the book of Jeremiah. Well, we see the uh, type and shadow of this book where lamentation is uh, Jesus weeping over the prophet, just like how Jeremiah weeped over Israelites, same way we see Jesus weeping as a weeping prophet. Well, the book of Lamentation in Hebrew, uh, it's, uh, it means how, is a collection of the poetic laments for the destruction of Jerusalem. So in the Hebrew Bible, it appears in the Ketiv, means the writings, as one of the five megalot, means one of the five scrolls, along with the Song of Songs, the Book of the Ruth, Ecclesiastes, and the Book of Esther. And this will be the first, uh, fifth scroll. Although there is no set order, so in the Christian Old Testament, it follows uh, with the Book of Jeremiah, as a prophet Jeremiah is a author of this book. However, in the modern scholarship, while the destruction of Jerusalem is by Babylon, uh, forms the background to this poem. And the very purpose we see here is, as a result of Judah's continued and unrepentant over the idolatry, and God allowed the Babylonians to besiege, plunder, burn, and destroy the city of Jerusalem, because the Solomon's temple which had stood for approximately 400 years, is now burned to the grounds by the Babylonians. Why? Because of the sin nature of the Israelites. So the prophet Jeremiah was an eyewitness of these events, and we see that he weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over the uh, destruction of the city and the people. So with that weeping, with that lament, he wrote the book of Lamentation, which, uh, uh, which occurred to Judah and Jerusalem. So this book is uh, not a very easy or a pleasant one to read as it is very uh, sad poems. Well, Jeremiah wrote these lamentations after soldiers from Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. And 
Jerusalem has been a very beautiful city because the temple, which is the house of God, was in Jerusalem. And you know, Solomon and all his wisdom and all his richness, he constructed the temple and also the city was nurtured and built that way. It was very beautiful, very nice. But then what happened? Sin took over. People, when they settled in, in the place, they started sinning going against God. But the soldiers, uh, so they had, uh, so the Babylonian God had to allow the Babylonians to come and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. Now the soldiers destroyed the buildings and they killed many people. So when there's a uh, death all over, can you imagine the lament and all over the city crying, crying, crying everywhere? Everywhere you see this death and there was crying. I don't know about people before who lived, but in our time, even we have experienced such a lament all over the city in this pandemic, isn't it? We would have, when, whenever we switch on the TV news, we see people lamenting over their loved ones everywhere. And in the second way, we saw the own loved ones, the family members, crying out when they missed the loved ones. To many, it happened in their own family. To many, very close to one loved ones, they lost. And we experienced that lament. So imagine how this whole city was crying. Many were killed. They led the young men away to Babylon as a captive. And the soldiers even forced the young women to have sex with them. You see the torture, the torment which the Israelites had to go through because they sinned against God. They sinned against God. They worshipped other God. They allowed, uh, they allowed the idols of the other God, the Babylonian God or the other gods in the place where they lived to be kept inside the temple and they worshipped. And some of them were kept outside the temple in the outer courtyard. Imagine that, how God would have been. We will see that, we will study more deep about that in the next book, in the book of Ezekiel. So here we see Jeremiah saw all these, okay, uh, uh, the terrible things happening to the people of Israel and he weeps and he weeps. And he knew all these things will happen because they happened because the people of Jerusalem didn't obey God and his law. So people pray to the evil gods. And in fact, God sent his servants to warn the people, but then they never heeded to his voice. And then they had to face a consequence of their own act. And Jeremiah was very sad when he wrote Lamentation, but he still had that hope because his sad words, he wrote about God's love. Jeremiah knew that God cares. God loves, he cannot destroy his people completely. So Jeremiah wanted the people uh, who were in capital to trust God again. And Jeremiah knew that God would not always punish his people, but he will show mercy and grace upon them. So Jeremiah also prayed that the people would return to Jerusalem from the captive. So we see uh, Christ's shadow on this. As Jer uh, Jerusalem was a symbol of God's people. Uh, with it being destroyed, God's judgment on his people in Peridin. And we see the display of God's love. Like God, uh, Though God uh, does not tolerate the sin, and um, he made that known to the world when the Babylonians were captured and deported. As a, deported. But then what happened? Yet God did not leave his people without hope. So Jeremiah prophesies about God's grace and his love. And he promised that the exile would last about 70 years, so that that would be a, a message of hope for the people who are in the exile. And he kept his promise for the sake of the greater promise that the Israelite had, that the Savior would come from so when that Savior came, he also lamented over Jerusalem. We see Jesus when he came. We, we read that in the book of Luke chapter 19, that Jesus wept over the city and its sin and destruction about 600 years later. Also, the state of Jerusalem was like that.
and though they rejected God's Savior yet again, he will he still went to the cross to pay the price for their sin and later call them to repentance through his apostles. See the heart of God. That's how God is. He does not leave us. He does not forsake us. He always keeps his promise. So even in this uh, terrible judgment, we move on to the next slide. Here we see um, in the Lamentation chapter 1 different ways. Okay, It talks about there's no rest, no pasture, no strength, no comfort, no satisfaction, no liberty, and no joy. So what is our present condition before God today? Can we relate to any of these incidents in our life? Are we in any of this circumstance or situation given in our life? Even in this season, God is a God of hope. There's a message that we can apply it to ourselves today. No matter what our situation, our circumstances are, but God is a God of hope. We can take this and apply it in our life that God will never give up on us because he says his promises are forever. He is a promise-keeping God. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So all what we have to do is repent, turn back to him. No matter how far we have gone from him, but we have this hope that we can return to him and find his compassionate and forgiving love because our God is a loving God. And because of his great love and compassion, he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins on the cross so that we can live eternally with him. So God is a uh, God's faithfulness and uh, even his plan of deliverance and his plan of salvation for us is active. All we have to do is repent and turn back to God. Search God. Seek him with all your heart, mind and soul and you will find him because that's what the word of God says. Seek and you will find him. Knock and it will be open. Yes, we need to ask and keep continuing to ask till you receive it. And with this, the book of Lamentation ends with the hope that God is a God of hope. God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And we have all of him the minute we repent and turn to him. We can have, we can experience that in our life. So with that, we will move on to the book of Ezekiel. Uh, before we could move on to the book of Ezekiel, any questions, anything that you would like to add on to the book of Lamentation? Class? If you would like to add on anything? Okay. I, yes, John. Yeah, I was, I was thinking, um, in, a, in the midst of all the um, worry uh, verses that we see, we also see that 322, which is so comforting. Um, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. Amen. And new every morning, great is your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. True true, great is God's faithfulness, his mercies on you every morning. Amen. So with this message of hope, thank you, John, for sharing that. Yes. So with this message of hope, we can move to the next book, next book of the prophet Ezekiel. Well, the author itself is Ezekiel and it was written it was written between 592 to 5, uh, between 573 or 570 BC because the dates are approximate. We all know we don't actually go on the date, but then approximate date for our understanding they have recorded. Well, this book has 48 chapters. And to start with, Ezekiel means God's strength or strengthened by God. So he, uh, there's a little bit of personal information in the first chapter that he was the son of Buzi. He had an 
uh, Buz, uh, okay, uh, had a wife who died as a sign to Judah. When King Nebuchadnezzar began his final sage on Jerusalem, we read about that in chapter 24, that he ministers during the darkest days of Judah's history. So during the first Babylonian attack on the city, they spared the city, but they took uh, the first wave of Israelite as prisoners and hold them as an exile in their city, in their nation. Well, the Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after that he was in the exile. And there is a strong evidence that Ezekiel was the author because we see that he has recorded it in chapter 1 and chapter 24. Well, Ezekiel actually lived in his own private dwelling uh, place as he was in exile in Tel Abib by the river Kedar, Kebar, uh, about 50 miles south of Babylon. Well, just like uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel was a priest and a prophet. So we see more of the prophet's uh, uh, call or prophet's office in his life, just like Jeremiah. So he was carried to Babylon before the final assault on Jerusalem. Somebody has come, I'll just admit them. Okay. Back to the presentation. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we see that Ezekiel you, uh, also used prophecies. But Ezekiel uh, used something very different, like parables, signs, symbols to dramatize God's message to his exiled people. You see the set of Israelites in the Babylon as an exile. And here people are uh, uh, lamenting, saying that our life is and what happened to all the promises that God made. And we are here in the exile, how long it would be. Yes, uh, Jeremiah did say 70 years, but then it is very difficult for people to take it. And they start weeping. Those who love God started weeping. And here there's a message of Ezekiel. God raised a prophet among those exiles to give them a comfort in that season, to give them a message that God is working in their life, to deliver the message that I am a God who have never forgotten you. I am in midst of you, though you may be in the exile because of your sin and you, you're facing the consequence of your own act, but then I'm your God, the true God who lives among you. Here he raises another servant to prophesy prophesy God's message to them. So as he experienced uh, uh, this is a several of visions during this 20-year period, okay, a, pe uh, a period with span of final destruction of Jerusalem. So here we see, uh, as we study this uh, book of the major prophets, prophets, we see each book talk about a person, about the blessed trinity, uh, which has been emphasized in these three great prophets. One is Jeremiah. So in, in the book of Jeremiah, when we, when we study that book, we see Jeremiah is a prophet who's emphasizing on the father where we see he portrays father's love and he weeps over Israel and he's also known as weeping prophet. So we see more of father's love over Israel. And the second is uh, Isaiah, uh, the prophet of the son. Why? Because Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah very clearly. When we read Isaiah 9.6, Isaiah 9, 6, where it says, um, for unto us a child is born, uh, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So we see how Isaiah prophesied, prophesied on the Son, on Jesus, the coming Messiah, very clearly. And also we see the book of Ezekiel, which we are studying today, is a prophet who emphasizes on the Holy Spirit, the move of God, the move of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in getting a lot of visions when the Spirit of the Lord moves and he's, he talks about God's glory, the presence of God, the Shekinah, which was present in the tabernacle. 
and how the spirit moved, left the tabernacle when people sinned, when people started worshipping the idolatry. So we see that Ezekiel was moved by the spirit of God and he sees a, a series of vision about God's presence. towards the people of uh, Israel who lived in Babylon. And we also, uh, uh, this book, okay, uh, we, I'll, I'll just present the presentation. Yes. So this book uh, 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 has the visions which are constructed around three themes. What are the three themes? One, judgment on Israel from chapter 1 to 24 and judgment on the nation from chapter 25 to 32. Then we see the future blessings for Israel, including the building of a new city from chapter 33 to 48. So this may be broken down further as follows. Okay, uh, the prophet and the coming fate of Jerusalem from chapter 1 to 7 and a vision of Jerusalem's sin from chapter 8 to 11 and we see uh, the elders and prophets in chapter 12 to 15 and we see the list of it allegories and parables and yeah it goes on till chapter 40 to 48 the vision of the uh, uh, renewed city the oracles against God nation in chapter 25 to 32 and we see Jerusalem's fall oracles of salvation chapter 33 to 39 and we see the vision of the renewed city temple and the land from 40 to 48 with this we will move on to our bible chapter 1 so you all can turn your bible to chapter 1 so in chapter 1, we see that the fifth year of Joachim's captivity by the river Kedar. And then suddenly uh, Ezekiel gets a vision and he sees a storm cloud approaching him. And he sees a storm cloud approaching him. And then inside the cloud are four strange creatures. He's seeing all this in a vision and that they have four wings outstretched and touching each other and these creatures each had four faces and then he saw four wheels each creature had four wheels down and then he saw the wings of the creature were supporting uh, you know this dazzling platform and on that platform is a throne and then there's a, there's a man, a human-like figure, sitting on the throne, with glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel gets the realization what he's seeing, it is the glory and the appearance. You know, it is the appearance and the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And it is God who's riding his royal throne chariot. Now, the word glory in Hebrew means kavod. It means heavy or significant. Kavod, okay, it is pronounced as kavod, uh, means heavy and significant. The uh, biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and the manifestation of God's significance. So when he shows up in person, these images and the vision, they are very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai on the in, when we read the book of Exodus. And it also very similar to the depiction of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. So do you, uh, were you able to recollect where also we saw these four creatures when we were studying these books? Where did we see? We also studied on these four creatures when we were studying the book of Numbers. Do you remember? When we studied the book of Numbers, I did show you this picture, the picture of the tabernacle and how uh, God planned and how the people of Israel, the 12 tribes were aligned around the tabernacle 
all the 12 tribes. So we see here the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of, sorry, Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan were aligned this way. And they had the banners. They had the banners of lion, man, bull, and eagle. Okay, and these were the exact four creatures which Ezekiel saw in his dream. And also we can relate this to the revelation in the presence mm -hmm. of God in the throne that there were four, four creatures, the face of the four creatures, same like this. And later we also see that, uh, you know, they carried this banner everywhere they went. And yeah, it was like this, face of a man, face of a bull, face of a eagle, and face of a lion. This is what we studied when we studied the book of Numbers. And now Ezekiel gets a similar vision. We will go back to Ezekiel now. Okay, I'm back to the presentation. Yeah, so, uh, and that's actually the vision uh, which he was getting, the presence of God, okay, uh, which was God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel vision is what is God's glory doing in Babylon? Because he saw the presence of God leave the tabernacle in that vision, which has wheels, okay? All the four creatures had a wheel and they left the temple and they moved toward the exile of the Babylon, the presence of God. Now, we need to, we have a question. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple in Jerusalem. So the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel for their rebellion nature. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne of chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. And then in chapter 2, we see that God addresses Ezekiel as the son of man. And he says, the children of Israel have transgressed, have sinned against me. And um, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy regardless of whether they hear you or not. I command you, not do not be afraid. Okay, go and prophesy to this people. And he also gives him a scroll filled with words of lamentation. And further in the next chapter, we see that Ezekiel is commanded to eat that scroll. And when he ate that scroll, it tasted as sweet as an honey. Ezekiel was a watchman. We see that here in this chapter 3. We see that Ezekiel as a watchman and he uh, and uh, he, he does not want the wicked and the wicked die because of their sin nature. And Ezekiel is answerable for it. And now we see Ezekiel tell them the wicked do not listen to him. So now before he did not tell, so he was accountable for their sin. But now when Ezekiel is telling them, and though the Israelites are not listening, now Ezekiel is not answerable because he is telling them what he needs to say. He did his call, what God has appointed him to. So likewise, Ezekiel is answerable if a righteous a righteous man commits iniquity and is not warned. So he also performs signs. So what? how Ezekiel is uh, uh, de uh, uh, declaring the message to the people of Israel. Like he also uh, performs signs and acts. And uh, these were the uh, small form of street theater. Like he enacted them and he started showing them because people need to understand. People need to understand the consequence. People need to get the message what they are. And uh, also it was one of the way which can be communicated to those people. See, the times and seasons are changing and people's understanding also is different from time to time. They were uh, sometime back, people used to announce certain things through a person. You know, there's a group of houses or a community of people used to live 
okay in uh, in sometimes maybe few years back we saw uh, there was a messenger will be sent and he'll make some uh, sound we call it dangura they make some sound and he announces so in those days so there are different seasons how they announce it so in our days we see any announcement need to be reached we see through the television through the news uh, you know through it's been circled through the social media so everyone having a, a smartphone in their hand gets the news so that is one way to deliver the news so in those days they used to perform acts so ezekiel was enacting what the what god was giving him the message so ezekiel would go out on public and start behaving in his weird ways through which he can deliver the message to uh, to the people of israel yes the previous prophet jeremiah he wept and cried to deliver the message to uh, to the people of israel and and you know what happened that no one heard him through though they were going through uh, the consequence of their sin but still people uh, you know their heart was so hard and they could not hear him the same uh, with ezekiel so ezekiel is trying to do differently he's trying to enact it okay uh, he is going out in public and he's trying to say in different uh, parable ways in the way people can understand and um, though uh, god prepares ezekiel that no matter what you say people a uh, heart has been hardened they may refuse to hear you but then but then ezekiel i want you to speak what i am telling you be my mouthpiece because i have appointed you as a prophet over my people today god may ask us also god may raise us as a prophet and god is saying no matter what no matter what our people our own people our family our church our people in our nation may not give ear to you but then i have called you i have appointed you as a leader as a servant as a prophet over the city over the nation over your family but you speak to them you be my mouthpiece they hear or do not hear you be my mouthpiece god who spoke this to ezekiel the same god is speaking to you and me today god wants us to speak god wants us to be his mouthpiece and we see ezekiel represents jerusalem and he he takes up a clay a clay or a tile or a brick something like that made out of clay which is easily breakable and then he takes a iron pan and you know he 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 breaks it into pieces and he says and he says israel you will be like this this will be your state if you don't listen to god your condition is like the clay your condition is like the tile when the enemy hits over you you will break it in pieces and ezekiel also is commanded by god to lie on his left side for 390 days because the house of israel had 390 years of iniquity and then later on his right side for 40 days because judah had 40 years of iniquity and during this time we see that ezekiel must eat the worst kind of food and that is uh, that needs to be cooked uh, using the cow dung the dry cow dung as the fuel some of you all know in the remote areas in the villages uh, because uh, the the fuel may be very expensive the gas may be very expensive so they use the cow dung they dry it as a pancake type they dry it in the sun and they use that uh, to burn to cook food you know we have seen in the remote part of india we have still in the urban uh, sorry in the rural areas in, in the villages in india we see people still use this to for their fuel so we see god commanding ezekiel to cook food like that and eat so this to denote the scarcity of provision fuel and the necessity during the siege of jerusalem and then we see uh, uh, god commanded uh, there are certain signs that he does okay ezekiel so ezekiel shaves his uh, hair shaves his hair and he must burn the third burn the third and the other third with cut with his knife and scatter the other third with the wind and indicate that judgment to be executed on the inhabitants of 
Jerusalem. And further, the judgment are then counted more openly, including the famine and uh, and uh, famine. And he also uh, uh, played uh, Ezekiel had to play uh, the role of a scapegoat on the day of atonement tying himself both the hands and the legs and he acted as a scapegoat. This is how Israel you will be. And he also sets his face uh, toward the mountain and prophesies against Israel saying its high place will be made desolate and they shall be known that I am the Lord, a remnant shall be saved however. And then, uh, you know, he goes on prophesies in two different ways and he delivers the message but then but then the Israelites do not give heed to him. There's the false prophets among them who, who draws the people saying, don't believe him. God is not like that. You know, he keeps uh, encouraging people. This false prophet will keep encouraging people not to listen to Ezekiel. And and after about a year, he has another vision and he has a series of vision we see. Okay, uh, we may not be able to go through all the vision in this class, but then I would encourage you all to please go through this book. And after about a year, he has another vision and this one is about the temple and he goes on a virtual tour of the temple and he sees what's happening there in his absence. And it is not good. Where in the outer courtyard, in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel, who are called to be the leaders, worshipping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And he sees the women of Israel. They are worshipping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And in the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving away from the temple. It leaves and goes towards the east, headed towards the Babylon. Now Ezekiel is trying to intercede for his people, but God will not be entreated. So in chapter 11, we see that um, why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Because uh, Israel's idolatry and their covenant violation has become so offensive that God has left his temple. They have driven him away and it consigns it to destruction. And God has an abundant his people. And we see that uh, at the end of his vision, we see that God promises that he will return. He will return as a remnant of Israel to the land and he will transform them by removing the heart of stone and giving them a, a, a soft heart, a heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. Yes, this is a small hope that we can get from this message and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the destruction. We see that uh, uh, we see that it helps us to understand how the rest of the book has been designed. In chapter twelve uh, to twenty-four, we see that God uh, focuses on God's judgment coming to Israel, and there is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And then we see Ezekiel shows its fondness on parables and uh, and allegories. So he depicts Israel was burnt, useless stick as a rebellious wife or as a dangerous ra ragging lion that gets captured and as two uh, promiscuous sisters. And these are all the depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and the idolatry acts that result in their destruction. So in this uh, section, we see that Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer and he begins arguing the case. And the first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation. And yeah, the time is going. Mm. Give me a minute while I share the... And we see... Um, the later part of the book, we also see that uh, the mountains of Judah occupied uh, 
I mean, a lot of depictions have been shown by Ezekiel's vision. And also Ezekiel gets another vision in chapter 37 that Ezekiel is set in the midst of a valley full of dry bones. And we see Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the dry bones, saying, Hear the word of the Lord as Ezekiel prophesies, the bones are joined together and covered with flesh. And in the same way, Israel shall be brought up from its grave. And Ezekiel is commanded to write Judah on one stick and Ephraim on the other, which will become joined into one stick in his hand. And at the restoration, there shall be no more idolatry. So David shall reign and God shall be in his sanctuary. So there's a kind of message of hope here. And the Lord will intervene and execute the furious judgment against the Gog and the Magog. He talks about the Lord will be known in the eyes of many nations. And <clears throat> and in, uh, in, in chapter 40, we see that Ezekiel uh, has another vision in the four, uh, 14th year after the destruction of Jerusalem. Ezekiel has a vision that a man appearance of brass with a line of flakes in his hand and measuring reed uh, temple is described. The exact dimension of the east, north, south gates are given and there is further description of the eight tablets of the preparation of the sacrifice, uh, tables, sorry, mm, the chambers and the porch and all measurements are given precisely from the cubits and the chamber and the ornaments of the palm tree and cherubims are described and we see the glory of the Lord fills the temple and the measurements of the altar are given in the cubits and we see the presence of God back in that place. So the east gate is kept to be permanently shut for the Lord has entered through it into the temple. So the prince shall enter and leave the porch of that gate. So strangers, uncircumcised and heart of flesh are not to be admitted to the sanctuary. So the Levites will minister in the sanctuary regulations for Levites and they must be clothed in linen. So there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, guidelines given to the Levites and the Levites who worked at the high place would be punished by becoming uh, mer temple servants. Only the priest at the temple in Jerusalem would fully carry priestly duties and not anyone else. And um, talks about same thing, repeat of uh, whatever was instructed before to Moses has been here. And uh, later in 47, chapter 47, we see the vision of the holy water issuing out of the temple, starting as a shallow stream and uh, then getting deeper and fuller until it is over a man's head. And we see the river travels east until it reaches a sea which will teem with fish. So only the marshy ground will be salty fruitful banks will grow on the bank of the river. So there's a description here of the division of the land shared between the Jews and the Porcelites. And then in chapter 48, we see that a description of the several portions of the land belonging to each tribe, um, yeah, together with the portion allotted to the sanctuary, to the city, and uh, yeah, the prince. Um, we see that. And uh, what do what is the Christ connection? What do we see the, uh, the Christ foreshadowing? in this book. We see that Ezekiel, as we know, Ezekiel means God's strength or strengthened by God. So this shows how God was connected with Ezekiel in a very dark and troubling time of Judah. As they were in the captive and struggling to keep their faith in the promised Messiah with the messages from God given to Ezekiel, he was trying to deliver and show that God is with them and God's mighty power for his people will deliver them. God also shows his grace in the picture of the Messiah as the true shepherd. He portrays the true shepherd, the good shepherd who will save and care for his sheep. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 23 that I will place uh, over them one shepherd, my servant, David will be, will uh, he will tend them and uh, he will keep them. He will be their good shepherd. So this is the message, the hope that the book of Ezekiel brings that God will be the good shepherd 
over them and it also portrays the messiah in this book that god will be the good shepherd with that uh, uh, we end this book of ezekiel and here i've listed few of the visions that uh, ezekiel received though we did not go through them i would recommend you to please go through this visions and uh, each vision as a message to um, to convey to the people who were in exile sorry that was nothing yeah so i leave this uh, class i mean open uh, where you can share uh, of your understanding of what you learned from the book of ezekiel that you would like to share um the vision that uh, ezekiel see in the beginning of the book is also i think similar to what uh, apostle john sees in the book of revelation and the vision uh, also depicts how the glory of god is um and even in revelation we see uh, the glory of jesus and also yeah. helps us to understand how great our god is and uh, the importance of being uh in all in reverence when we come before him yes thank you thank you john yes a time and again god shows us how majestic is his presence how awe it is yes his presence is great and we also see god's love i leave it to the class to say that what did we learn we see yes we see the heart of god time and again no matter how much israelites sin that he is there yes class please go ahead to share what you understand from this book can i share pastor yes yes that yeah please go ahead yeah of uh, uh, i i was thinking of uh, ezekiel uh, chapter 38 i think in which the dry bones vision uh, yes. is mentioned 37. and 37 okay yeah. uh so that vision always um, is uh, you know if we look at our lives also maybe there are things that we have you know there are uh, dreams you know that we have just that has just dried up or has dead is has uh, so it's no more we think it's all over but you know god uh, god is a god who can turn away all those and he can change those situations he can bring alive our dreams um what he has for us yeah so yeah i just wanted to share that yes yes thank you yes yeah similar situations when we are just like this royal we may have sin gone astray very far we may think that we cannot come back but then throughout the book from whatever we have read from these major prophets from Jeremiah Isaiah or Ezekiel we see the same message has been repeatedly said like Israel I know that you have sinned you have gone very far from me yes though you feel that your sins may not have uh, is not worth to be forgiven but then I am a god of mercy and love time and again god is portraying himself as he is a god of love god of mercy god of grace he's saying all you have to do is come out yourself to the lord repent and commit come back and i am the lord who will embrace you with the love just as if you have not sinned that is a call time and again time and again God has never given up on his people and he can never give up on his people he is the god of redemption he had a big plan in his mind and he continued to send his prophets time and again to convey that message of hope i have a plan to redeem you i have a plan jeremiah 29:11 very beautiful verse and everyone knows that i have a plan there is a call to redeem you to give you 
to make you prosperous. Very beautiful message and very beautiful book. And uh, yes, we can prepare ourselves to uh, read another major prophet book tomorrow. We will study on the book of Daniel. So with this, uh, can I request one of us to please pray and close the session with a word of prayer, please. Rosalind, would you like to pray? Okay, anyone in the class? Brother Shubash, you would like to pray? Yes, Pastor. <clears throat> yes. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we come to your presence. Yes. Lord, we thank you so much for us speaking to us, Lord, from this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for dear pastors, Lord. Thank you that you have given a wonderful mentors and uh, teachers, Lord, who always guide us. And Lord, speaks to us through your word. Continuously, I pray that you bless them, bless their family. I pray especially for all of us, Lord, who are learning together. Bless the Lord, uh, each one of us, that, Lord, we will learn properly, Lord, and we will implement it in our life and ministry, Lord. Thank you. Praise you. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for joining in today's class. And uh, yeah, Zeli, there is a question from you. Okay. Okay. That's okay, Rosalind. No worries. Zeli, I hope you're there online. And something to share regarding the assignment. I am having some issues with the laptop. Okay. No problem. I will extend your time. It is... Uh, I've extended, I've given the deadline till November. So before that, you can present it. And uh, very soon, you will be also given with your final assignment. And maybe a week or two, I will give you the final assignment. And you all can, you know, together prepare and submit it. Is that okay, Zeli? Like, I was just thinking, you know, uh, if I write it by name and submit it. Okay, you want to write and submit it? Okay, please go ahead. You can do that. Okay, yes, you can do that. God bless. Um, Ma'am, I just got a question. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. so the assignment submission date, has it been extended for everyone? Uh, what was the cutoff date that given on the system? Uh, for me, it is actually Saturday. Uh, like my What was the time? It is, um, sorry, October 30th, mm -hmm. I guess. Oh, 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 sorry. It, uh, okay, I will extend it to uh, November, November 28th. Okay, I will do that today itself. I will extend for everyone. Okay, for everyone, I will extend the date. So is it both for uh, Ministers Foundation as well as Old Testament Survey? Mm, I'm just thinking. Oh, okay, okay, sure, Pastor. Uh, I'm just thinking how it works. Okay. Uh, uh, is it difficult for everyone to submit it on time or you all have some challenges? Uh, yeah, uh, like for me, of course, <laughs> because uh, there's, okay. um, yeah, I feel a lot of, a little bit preparation is required. Uh, okay. Yeah, to consolidate those. Okay, books. okay, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, I'm sure with others also maybe because they also work and try to study. Um, okay. Do no, this. I, can, I can submit uh, after 10th November. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we can do, keeping in mind for everyone is, um, okay, we will extend the time. Yes, ma'am. Assignment, ma'am. Assignment will attestment on on uh, Google Classroom or anywhere. Uh, you have to attach it on the Google class Classroom. Only then I can grade it for you. Okay. Okay. Listen, as this class has been recorded, these assignments are same for both. Okay, for the e-learning and for the. Um, online class students okay but for the online class students you all have to upload your assignment on google classroom and for the e-learning you all can give it on the platform okay well and for e-learning it's different and you all know the questions that uh, we keep asking you all on the platform you all can answer it directly on the platform itself but for online students you'll have to prepare and submit on google classroom for the grading purpose. I hope that was clear for both. 
divya uh, did yes. i uh, yes. clear yes. it for the online students and for the e learning you'll answer it directly on the platform where it is given for you okay thank you so much god bless god bless i will extend the time till uh, october 30th for both for the midterm submission and for the final submission is that okay october 30th of october okay october or november oh, november sorry november 30th thank you thank, thank you. you thank you okay i'll just type yeah november 30th i want both okay midterm and the final final uh, assignment is not yet given i will be giving it to you all in maybe a week or two okay but then the midterm you all have to prepare and start uploading it in the meanwhile i will also give you all with the final ass assignment thank you thank you ma'am that's a great one okay thing. So for the Thank two you. courses, it's November 30th. That is the deadline, right? For both courses. Yes. Yes, yes. November 30th is the deadline for both. So will you be uh, uh, changing that in the uh, in the Google yes, Classroom? Yes, I will do it. I will do it. Today itself, I will do it. I will extend the time period to November 30th. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. God bless you. See you all tomorrow at the next session. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>